I was a teenager when I first visited Hawaii Volcanoes National Park with my father in 1960. The Kapoho and Kilauea Iki eruptions with their spectacular fountains had just ended. I remember climbing around steaming vents and hiking across fresh lava fields. I have been photographing here ever since, first in stills and then later in video as well. The current eruption of Kilauea began on January 3rd, 1983. At our house in the town of Volcano, some nine miles away, we could easily hear the roar and feel a gentle vibration. At night, residents and visitors would watch these beautiful fountains from several locations. Geologists from the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory constantly monitored the eruption, and photographers like myself, Jim Griggs, Dorian Wiesel, and others worked with them or hiked out on our own to photograph and to just be there. Geologists, Ed Wolf and Dick Moore, are picking their way through a hostile landscape to collect samples and measure the temperature of the lava. This environment is an ever-changing mixture of swirling dust, volcanic fumes, smoke, hot shifting winds, and drifting tephra. There is a constant, loud, low, earth-trembling roar the terrain is mostly cinder covered, replete with burning trees, jumbled old a'a fields, and searing hot flows. Whenever I get this close to high fountains, I become extremely aware of the slightest changes in wind, sound, ground tremor, and radiant heat. I feel a mixture of awe, exhilaration, and terror. A change in the shape of the vent opening or a shift in the wind could leave any of us in an anoxic environment or under a deadly shower of glowing tephra and molten spatter. I believe that there is no experience comparable to being in a forest at night when an a'a flow is coming through. We are in Royal Garden subdivision on a fairly steep slope, and the flow is surging through a dense stand of tall ohia trees. The swiftly moving lava is covering trees even before they can burn. Steam escaping from their trunks adds a howl to the sounds of crackling flames, crashing branches, and rushing lava. The front of the flow is nearly 20 feet high, and incandescent blocks tumble down its face as it pushes forward. Early morning hours are my favorite here at Kupayanaha Vent. The lava looks great, the wind is gentle, and the low-flying helicopters haven't arrived yet. Sulfur dioxide fumes are a constant problem here. Geologist Ken Hahn has just returned from the downwind side of the lake after getting badly fumed while changing film in the time-lapse camera. I don't much like breathing in the gases, but this is a really great place to work and you just have to put up with a few minor inconveniences. The overturns moving across the surface towards us are produced by strong convection inside the lake as new lava enters it. It's a pleasant surprise to run into this ha'a -ha flow. We're shooting this at full wide angle from about 20 feet. By sitting on a log, I am able to get under the worst of the very intense heat so characteristic of ha'a -ha flows. Notice how the sides of the flow solidify into a channel for the fluid center. This is a typical forest scene after a flow has passed close by. It's June 22, 1989, and we are in a grove of llama trees just east of the Wahoula Visitor Center. The National Park Service is attempting to prevent flows from overrunning the structure 
by spraying the oncoming lava with water. The hope is that the water will cool and solidify the flow front, forming a barrier that will divert the main body of the flow. While the water is successful in causing the surface of the lava to skin over, it seems unable to extend its cooling to the flow interior, which readily breaks out once the water is removed. This fire crew is trying to fight a holding action along a 100-foot wide front. The limiting factor is water. The delivery system is simply incapable of pouring enough of it onto the flow to completely and permanently solidify the front. These fire crews are a real credit to the park in their dedication to their job, even in the face of an unrelenting onslaught of lava. It's interesting being under here with the floor on fire, but I don't think I'm going to stay much longer. It's always been nice to come back here to Wahaula and sit in the shade after a hot afternoon out on the flows. I can already tell I'm going to miss it. It's early April 1990, and we're tracking lava flows that are burning through the forest just outside the town of Kalapana. In order to figure out which way the flows are headed, we have to either walk the scorching flow fronts or crash through the flaming jungle just ahead of them. We work early in the morning because just a few hours in the heat and smoke exhausts us completely. The very thing that everyone has been dreading is happening. Lava flows are headed directly into the small town of Kalapana. Christina Helliker, Tari Maddox, and I are on nearly round-the-clock watches as we try to predict the lava's course for civil defense officials. At first, the lava seems to move capriciously, destroying some houses and bypassing others. Large volumes of lava are now entering Kalapana, blocking access and making the evacuation of people's belongings difficult, if not impossible. We are monitoring the temperature of this flow to see if it is the main front or just a minor breakout. The onslaught of lava in the town of Kalapana has begun in earnest by early May. Three slow-moving Pohoihoi flows are cutting a wide swath of destruction through town. Even though our primary work is to provide assistance to civil defense, it is impossible not to become caught up in the human drama that is being played out as people's homes and lives are overrun by lava. Some people choose to pack up everything, even moving entire houses, while others simply walk away and let Pele take what she will. In the aftermath of most natural disasters, like floods, fires, and hurricanes, you can still locate the street you lived on, and rebuilding is usually an option. Not so with lava flows. At Kalapana, houses, possessions, and even memories are permanently buried beneath 50 feet of hardened rock. It's February 18, 1992, and this is a new outbreak on the west side of Pu'u'o'o Kone. We got here just a few minutes ago after a four-hour hike. We are looking down on a line of small dome fountains that are slowly being drowned by flows from above. I got a call from geologist Jack Lockwood about nine last night. He said that as he drove up to the park, he could see a bright glow out on the east rift zone. A few phone calls later, I was able to determine that a significant breakout which is being called episode 50, had occurred around dusk. 
By the time I tried to line up a helicopter, I couldn't find anyone who would fly before 8 a.m., and I wanted to be out here by dawn. Fortunately, I found three geologists who were willing to help carry equipment, and we began hiking from the Manuulu trailhead around 1 a.m. USGS geologists Maggie Mangan and Christina Helliker are going out to get a lava sample. The trick is to leave it in long enough to get a nice glob of lava, but not so long that the cable becomes stuck to the channel wall. We are over on the west side of the flows now. The vent we were just standing beside is in the center of the picture, and the cinder cone towering above is Pu'u O'o. Although episode 50 lasted only two weeks, Episode 51 soon started up very nearby. Throughout the whole time, and indeed even during the Kupayanaha days, this lava pond inside Pu'uo'o has been active. It seems to act as a reservoir for lava before it is erupted at the vent. The rim of the pond is frequently falling in, so standing out here is always a trip. The fumes can be really nasty and often contribute to poor visibility. Sometimes we photograph late into the evening and spend the night up here. It's a kind of spooky place. I never sleep very well. This is the lava pond that the current vent drains into. When the pond level is low, the lava pours down the steep falls. That blowing material in the foreground is called Pele's hair. It consists of very thin filaments of volcanic glass that have spun off the frothy surface of the lava and adhered to nearby rocks. Episode 52 began before dawn on October 3rd, 1992. The vent here is beside these two geologists on the southwest side of Puo'o Cone. From there, the lava cascades down the cone till it hits a ridge where it splashes up into what looks like a small fountain. I'm scrambling up the side of the cone to get a better but much hotter view. Getting dropped off by helicopter in the midst of an eruption can be a bit dangerous because it takes a while to figure out just what is going on and where the best escape routes are. This channel is unusually large and fast moving. Here it is flowing over a small drop and forming a huge standing wave like the rapids in a big river. There is always a lot of heat rising above eruptions, making for unstable air and a very bumpy ride. Although I take a lot of aerial footage, I end up using very little of it due to the excessive motion. Still, if I have to film a burning forest, I'd rather do it from the air, where I won't get hit by falling trees or blown up by methane explosions. This flow is coming down a steep slope, Part of it is on an older flow, and part is burning through an ohia forest. It is traveling so quickly that many trees have been completely surrounded without yet catching on fire. This is Kamuamua. It is a beautiful green oasis with a newly formed black sand beach. Unfortunately, it lies right in the path of the advancing lava. The flows are moving with surprising speed, considering the flatness of the topography. They've reached the walls of the Heiau, and there is no pause in sight. It has taken hardly any time at all to fill in this whole enclosure. 
In a day, the flows have cut straight through the heart of Komoamoa and are expected to reach the ocean within the hour. Within the past few days, the flows have covered most of Komoamoa and advanced more than 100 yards seaward. This event was photographed by USGS geologist Tari Maddox. This is one of the things that can happen when seawater gets into a lava tube. The resulting steam explosions blow molten lava hundreds of feet in all directions. These bubbles are huge, on the order of 50 feet in diameter. These bubbles are also formed by the interaction of lava and water. Most are 5 to 10 feet in diameter, though a few are as large as a two-car garage. As they reach their maximum size, they quickly cool and shatter, blowing irregular shards and slightly curved sheets of translucent volcanic glass out into the wind. They are given the name Limu o Pele, which translates to seaweed of Pele, the Hawaiian goddess of fire. Here the wind is blowing away the steam, revealing a standing wave near the base of the flow. Water splashing onto it becomes incorporated into the lava, producing a stream of bubbles. It's early afternoon, and we're flying out to these new breakouts just south of Pu'u'o'o Kone. These 15 to 20 foot high dome fountains are spectacular from anywhere, but only when you get close like this can you easily see them forming. Getting the best footage is clearly a factor of being in the right place at the right time. Staying alive is a factor of not being in the wrong place at the wrong time. There is a fine shifting line between these two, and in a space of only a few seconds or feet, one can unknowingly go from relative safety to extreme danger. Here, all my senses are in a heightened state of perception, and I become acutely aware of even the slightest changes in my environment. When I can't account for a change, I never hesitate to run. Earlier today, USGS geologists detected an increase in shallow earthquakes and an actual physical swelling of the summit of the volcano. Soon the expansion became rapid, and it appeared that a large pulse of magma was entering the volcano. Scientists readied for a possible summit eruption, but after a few hours that activity subsided, and then these fountains broke out. What the volcanologists would really like to know is whether this lava is new material or like the same old stuff that was being erupted before the summit event. Geologist Carl Thornburr is preparing to collect a sample of spatter which will yield this information when it is analyzed for its geochemical and mineralogical composition. It's almost dawn on January 30th, 1997, and I am photographing from the west rim of Nepal Crater. Last night, scientists at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory reported that large earthquakes and strong tremor were indicating the underground movement of lava in this area. These fountains broke out here about 3 a.m. Now that dawn has arrived, we can see that the west wall of Pu'u'o'o collapsed overnight, giving the cone a decidedly bisected appearance. Fountaining has been tapering off for the past half hour, and I think there's going to be a shutdown here pretty soon.
This two kilometer long fissure just ripped open a little east of this morning's eruption site. We've been out here all day hoping another one would erupt. Fissure eruptions are very rare and short lived. What an opportunity to see one close up. The noise is incredible and the ground's shaking like crazy underneath us. Some of these fountains are shooting 100 feet into the air. Fortunately, we're standing on the upwind and uphill side of the fissure. It's approaching 3 p.m. and most of the other fountains have shut down, but these are getting more interesting. If you look carefully out there in the middle, you can see ribbon spatter thrown up by the bursting gas bubbles. We're sitting on the backside of Pu'u'o'o, watching two active vents spatter below us. Geologist Carl Thornburr is waiting here out of the line of intense heat and fumes to try and snag a sample of spatter. It's pretty hard running through the deep soft cinders on this steep slope, but big spatter bursts are always a powerful incentive. Brad Lewis and I are flying in on a late July morning to get a closer look at the activity in Pu'u'o'o. A massive river of lava is welling up in the vent and immediately pouring down into a hole in the crater floor. By the time I get set up on the ground, Brad has climbed to the summit of Pu'u'o'o and the lava lake is filling up. I've joined Brad high on the rim where we can actually look down into the vent as lava bubbles to the surface and fills the lava lake. We're even happier to be this high up when the lava starts overflowing the lower walls of the crater where I'd just been. These huge drain holes just opened up in the center of the lake. It looks like someone pulled the plug on a giant bathtub. The lake level is dropping very quickly now as a huge volume of lava disappears underground. Pu'u'o'o continues to disintegrate in February 1999 as gaping holes coalesce on its south side. Once towering a thousand feet over the surrounding terrain, repeated collapses of the summit and lava piling at the base have reduced Pu'u'o'o to half its original height. Just a moment ago, these giant lava bubbles started bursting from the center of the bench. The explosions are rapidly increasing in intensity and begin to bombard the coast with red-hot spatter, forcing everyone to quickly retreat inland. Within 10 minutes, the jets of ash, rock, and steam have grown several hundred feet high. These littoral explosions rain debris, including some very large rocks, well inland of the bench. What an incredible sight. This bench is collapsing just as we fly over it. The eruption paused today, and as the remaining lava drains out, large pieces of the unstable bench cave off and explode. The bench collapsed here yesterday. The collapse severed a deep lava tube, creating this beautiful fire hose flow.
The lava stream is about three feet in diameter and shoots 15 feet straight out from the sea cliff. On top of the poly, a big surge of lava is bursting from the main channel and rushing down the steep terrain. I'm back on the ground now looking up. I think the surge has reached the base of the slope, but I can't see where it's gone and it's making me a bit nervous. I heard it before I saw it. The trees above me are exploding into flames as lava floods from the channel. It's moving awfully fast, coming over both sides of the ridge like liquid fire. My first instinct is to grab the camera and run, but instead all I can do is stand and stare. I've never seen lava move like this so far away from the vent. Trees are still standing as the flowing lava pours down in multiple channels. It's one of the most beautiful and eerie sights you can imagine. As the steam clears its sunrise, Rivulets of lava come into view. Incandescent streams are chilled by the waves and shattered into steaming chunks of black sand, adding to the new beach in front of me. This new land is notoriously unstable. Pieces are breaking off right before my eyes. Larger and more lethal bench collapses are a possibility I always keep in mind. The huge flow that broke out from near Puo'o on Mother's Day is quickly moving downslope, burning trees and setting off wildfires. The flow is split into several fingers that are moving down the poly through forest and grasslands. The cars and buildings at the end of the road are clearly in the path of this flow, and it's picking up speed. Even though we've been out since 4 a.m., I want to be here when it crosses the road this afternoon or evening. This three-hour time-lapse sequence shows how fast the lava advances and inflates as it pushes towards the road. The National Park Service is responding to this new threat, evacuating cars and moving signs, cones, and even the lua to a safer location. It's now 7 p.m., and hundreds of visitors are witnessing lava crossing the road for the first time since 1995. Choking fumes from the burning asphalt soon force them to move upwind. From high offshore, we can see part of the vast lava field erupted from Pu'u'o'o during the past 20 years. This summer's flows covered another several hundred yards of road. We've come to check out several skylights high up on the tube system. Hidden in the back of this skylight within a hornido is a little cave filled with strange feathery stalactites. Puo'o is filled to the brim with lava, with at least six vents active at the same time. Yeah. 
These eastern cones are putting on quite a show and have built some large spatter chimneys. Lava pouring from the cones is filling up the lava lake. The lava lake keeps overturning as it fills. New upwelling lava rolls over the thin solid crust, which buckles and is immediately sucked back down into the lake. 